Hey, friendos! This begins my ALAAC, the American Librarian Association Annual Conference. This begins my ALAAC review, and we're starting it by looking at a pile of the stuff I'm going to bring. Now, ALAAC is a librarian-focused conference. Um, the primary attendees are adult librarians, so it's very different from anime cons, and it's even a little bit different from indie cons. You will get librarians, of course, at both anime and indie cons. I know I've certainly met quite a few that way. But this is a conference just for people who love books so much they made it their lives. And I'm going to be tabling in the Artist Alley. Now, what that means is I created... This piece of art here, you guys can actually check out the time, la time lapse for this. I created this piece of art here, watercolor on watercolor paper, for their art auction. I submitted it, and it was accepted. This piece of art is my payment for the table. So other than that, I don't have to pay for the table, which I think is a phenomenal trade. I'm super happy to do it. I'm super happy they accepted it. And since it's in New Orleans this year, and I'm actually from New Orleans, I painted Kara. Well, I'm from Luling. I painted Kara, who lives in Hawnville, Louisiana, which is 15 minutes out, if that, from Luling, reading a copy of The Cajun Night Before Christmas, which is kind of like the de facto. There's not a lot of kids' books set in Louisiana. So uh, from kindergarten to fourth, we read a lot of Cajun Night Before Christmas. So I have to admit, it is not one of my favorites, only due to overfamiliarity. However, I can't lie and say it wasn't a big inspiration for 7-inch Kara because I did set Kara in my home state. So I am incredibly excited about this opportunity. Um, it sort of feels right. It feels like everything's going to come together. I'm from Louisiana. Kara is set in Louisiana. I'm getting ready to launch Volume 2 on Kickstarter, so that's super exciting. This show is in Louisiana. This is a kid-lit graphic novel in kind of a traditional illustration style. And that seems to be what librarians are looking for. At least that's what they say they're looking for. There's been a big push to get graphic novels in libraries. So I am really, really excited. Um, most of my prep did not focus on merch. Most of my prep focused on new signage. So I have two new banners. I have a bunch of new table signs, which I'll show you guys at the con. I have new portfolios for people to look at things. I can't wait to show you guys all of those things at the show. I have a really naggy cat who thinks he's going outside, yet he won't perform for the camera. I am located right across from the Zine pav Pavilion. In fact, I'll share my maps with you guys. But I am really excited. We leave tomorrow. We're driving because I have a lot of stuff to bring. And the first time I did ALAAC, it was in San Francisco. We flew. It was a nightmare. I was so frazzled by the time we got there. Um, so this time we're driving, bringing a lot of stuff, but we can kind of move at our own pace. So hopefully that will go a lot better. I'll check in with you guys as I'm doing more of my packing, show off more of the amazing goodies I am bringing this weekend. I'm not bringing the Grey Beast, but I am so excited. I'm so excited to visit my home. I'm so excited to sell my books in my home. I'm so excited to connect with librarians in my home state, librarians from my home state. Um, I'm just really, really pumped. I think this is going to be a great trip. I'm going to bring a lot of positive energy to this. And uh, also, I love my placement because I am across from the bathroom, so everybody's got to visit me. I'm right by concessions, so everybody's got to visit me. I'm right across from the zine pavilion, which is cool because I do self-pub stuff. And I'm super close to the graphic novel publishers. So um, maybe I'll be haunting their tables. I don't know. It just feels really good this year. So crush your fingers for me. I hope it's going to be really good for me this year. Hey guys, so it is like 11.30. We got in at, I guess, what, like two, two in the morning. I finally got to sleep around three. Um, fortunately, today is a late start day. It's not going to be open to the public until 5.30. So what we sort of figured was we would go get some coffee, go get some breakfast, and then head on over, bring our stuff over there. So I'm staying at the Maison St. Charles, and um, this is on St. Charles Street. And the Memorial Center that the show is at is actually under, well, it's past the interstate, so you have to go under the interstate to get there. It seems like it's very walkable distance, but being from this area, 
I know you don't really want to be walking under the bridge, especially carrying a bunch of stuff if you can help it. So um, I wonder if um, ALAC had like an official con hotel. So when I applied and was accepted, it took them like a month and a half to send me the official emails. I think I didn't get added to the mailing list properly. So I have no idea if there was a con block or say con block, a show block and I just missed it or or that information wasn't sent to artists or what. Our hotel is really nice. I'm really happy with it. Um, it has this super cute little courtyard. The rooms we're staying in are basically renovated old houses. So I'm really happy with the hotel. I'm just not, we're not going to be walking under the bridges. Um, so what I think the plan is, you have to valet park here. We're going to get them to bring the car around. We're gonna get our stuff and then we're gonna call a lift and have a lift drop us off at the Memorial Center. Um, and that way we're not worrying about parking because we have to, it's 25 per night to park here or 25 per day to park here. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense to pay the same kind of fee at another lot closer to the Memorial Center. And it would probably just be cheaper to take a lift. So um, the show starts at 5.30 and it goes from 5.30 to 7 today. So uh, breakfast and then set up. All right, we have finally arrived at our Artist Alley spot. So we went through registration and they did not really, there was one person, only one person who could help me as someone in the Artist Alley. Everyone else didn't have a clue and they had a lot of trouble bringing me up because it's studio name, or I'm sorry, company name is your last name in the Artist Alley. And then they couldn't bring up my assistant either, so she helped me out. So it's kind of like, what is the point of filling all this out on the site if that information isn't available to the people working registration? And I had a confirmation number that they said they couldn't even plug in. So it's like, for such a huge show, why is that not something that's taken care of? Anyway though, at the table now, it is a six foot by six foot space. Doesn't seem like there's room for anything else, which is good, we didn't bring the four foot table. There is a row of us, so it's a little bit different from the one in San Francisco, and we're right next to the zine pavilion, and then over there is the graphic novel stage. And this is huge. Um, the one in San Francisco was huge. This one is equally huge, and probably throughout the weekend, I will show you guys some of the huge, huge, huge book exhibits. But here, it looks like they have like a little workshop space for zines, which is good because we're like right across and I've got mini comics. We paid $15 to park in their, uh, the parking lot and there's no in and out. So we didn't have an opportunity to unload. So we're probably gonna be making several trips. There's also an alley. Can we walk down the alley with the different graphic novel publishers? There is an alley with different artist alley publishers as well. But as you guys can see, this is massive. And some of these people spend so much money on their booths because this is a great opportunity to get your software into libraries. Your beautiful statues into libraries. I mean, really the displays here are so inspiring. I know most of us are working on an artist alley budget, so we can't afford to do this, but it, it's definitely inspiration to try and do greater things than a print wall. And we are in Hall K. And there's even a chair company, Joseph says, that's Steelcase. They sell really nice office furniture. You can see from their setup here. They've got different examples of that. Oh, they have a Surface. Looks like a Surface Pro 3. This is definitely, or can definitely be very intimidating if you are a small independent publisher or a small uh, self-published artist because I mean look at just some of these setups they're huge but don't think of it as trying to compete with these guys because there's just no competition they have hundreds of thousands of dollars to dump into something like this and we might have a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars to dump into something like this so it's not even like an apt comparison
where to put the axe. You can pause it until we get the grids up. I think just leave it. Oh, yeah, maybe get that around the edge. I mean, not that, you know, the the side, not the bottom. We gotta clip all these, too, because they're just kind of hanging out everywhere. Yeah, sure. Get too tight. Don't make them too tight. Uh, it looks good right now. Too tight. Okay. All right. Just. I don't think you need to zip tie anything else. Just take Not off the clips. The no. Take off the clips. See what it looks like. That's basically perfect. So. You can go ahead. So I wanna show you guys something. I built this grid wall, four tall. I've done four tall in the past, but we're having some structural problems because the table is shy of six foot. And when the grid wall is properly assembled, it's a, a little bit over six feet. So the difference in inches is really not great. So we've had to push it in and that is causing the grid wall at the top to bow in. And since we did it four tall and we didn't properly, I guess, cause we don't have enough uh, table space to support what we're doing. It's also causing some structural bowing here. Now you guys know I've been talking about not doing the grid wall for a while, but this was a travel show and grid wall is really modular. So we thought it would, it would be an okay solution, but just given the constraints of this show, it doesn't really, it doesn't really seem like it's working in our favor. And we're hanging original art on it and that's adding weight and that's probably going to affect the structural stability. Now I know a lot of people's solution to this, especially for their print walls, is to do a photo backdrop. Um, I have not found that to be a really feasible solution for original art, um, although I've kind of brainstormed some ideas to make it work. Anyway, the reason I'm sharing this with you guys is grid wall is a really popular option for convention artists and I wanted to show you guys some of the problems that can come with when you've got too much weight, too many grids, and too small a table. All right guys, so it took way longer than I thought, way longer than I thought, 
but we finally got it done. We finally got it set up. We might change some things over the weekend to see what works. We ended up with a lot less space than we somehow planned for, or I don't know, maybe everything just grew giant. Um, one of the big mistakes was forgetting the spinner rack. The spinner rack, as you guys have seen, has like a one foot by one foot footprint, but it's vertical and it holds like, gosh, 12 minis. So um, I have like six minis. So it half, and then I can put like little pieces of original art in there. I mean, really forgetting the spinner rack was a huge mistake on my part. Um, and I will probably never forget the spinner rack again because I am so regretful that I forgot the spinner rack. <laughs> I'm so sad. Um, so some of the things that might rotate in, might rotate out this weekend are the mini prints. Well, I have only the original mini prints up right here. We have the mini print portfolio here. Um, the commissions might rotate out depending on interest. I thought people might enjoy that. It'd be like a cool souvenir, but um, not that kind of con, so it might not work. This is new. A lot of con artists are moving towards um, having these sort of promotional take a picture of this instead of taking a card kind of thing. So we'll see how that goes. Plus I have my normal promotional stuff. I also have multiple areas of Kara. So I have these up front where people can easily grab and flip. I have the big pages to attract attention from afar. Then I've got a nice healthy stack of books. Only thing I really need to do is tape this up and uh, also have Thousand and One Nights out. Now normally I would have one or two up front for people to be able to flip through them. We do have limited space right now, so that might be something I try later on in the weekend. We'll see how today goes and where people are the most interested, what areas they're most interested in on the table. I did have the pamphlet out earlier to display the painted wooden charms, but I felt like that was taking up a lot of room. It wouldn't have really fit in this area, and I can actually fit a lot more charms right here. So we'll see how that goes. I also removed the easel for this and have it just up against the grid. Um, I do have my print rack out. They might say something about it, they might not. I try to have it as discreet as possible. Sorry, that they're still setting up the area. So hopefully that's not going to be an issue. And then, so the scrim banner itself isn't the problem. It's like I showed you guys earlier with the buckling in the back because the tables are not quite six feet. But all in all, I tried to create a table that is cute and a fun experience. And if it's too busy, we'll figure that out. Um, I've done some new things with signage, well, new old things that used to work really well. I've kind of brought them back. Maybe not in the iteration I would have liked. This is a um, something I'm going to be playing with probably for the next year of shows. So this is my setup about an hour before the show. Hey guys, I am all set up at ALA 2018 in beautiful New Orleans, Louisiana, my hometown. And I am here to sell 7-inch carrot, which is set in Pawnville, Louisiana. So very near, very dear, very close to my heart. It is set in the home that my mother grew up in, the home my grandfather designed and built. So there's a lot of family pride there. I'm sure you guys are familiar with 7-inch Kara, so I won't give you the pitch, but that is my focus for this week since it's a Louisiana comic and we're in Louisiana. I've also got copies of Thousand and One Nights. It's an old lady night anthology. I'm sure you've heard of it from Kickstarter. It went viral. It was so huge. Also selling a lot of beautiful original art. Most of it is watercolor. Some of it is alcohol marker. Um, all of them are originals though, so you get to take home the real deal. As well as some very cute, very affordable mini prints. Some beautiful hand-painted charms. And I'm also, we'll see how this goes, I'm test running some commissions. I figured some of the librarians here might have friends or family who obviously could not make it to the show and they wanted to bring home a cool souvenir. So I thought I'd give that a shot at this show as well. We'll see how it goes. So I will continue to check in with you guys as the weekend progresses. Thank you guys so much for watching. And if you're a librarian at ALA, come see me in the artist alley. Come say hi. What's your table? Oh, um, I am 761. 
right by the Artist Alley Pavilion sign and right by the Zine Pavilion. Could not get a cooler spot. Hey guys, so they are shutting the lights off on us. It is seven o'clock on the first day. Today ran short. It was open from 5.30 to seven. Some people, trying to chase us out. Some people um, looking, not super many. Got to have some cool conversations. Um, I met a guy who collected, has like this huge art collection of like comic and uh, like advertising illustrations. So that was really cool. I changed my table up a little bit. I'm gonna show you guys, and I'm gonna do a little shopping tonight to go pick up some plate stands. As you guys can hear, tomorrow starts at nine. So I took the commission, no, the commission book's still on the table, but it may go off tomorrow. But uh, I removed the mini prints book and spread out some minis, and hopefully tonight I can find something good that I can use to display my minis. Otherwise, not really too much has changed. I'll check in with you guys tomorrow. All right, guys. Um, so it was the first day, very short day. A lot of tables were not even set up. I had the tallest display there. I had certainly the most artist alley display there, um, which I always feel like it's a bad thing, but I've been told by multiple people it's a good thing and that my stuff stands out. I'll show you guys tomorrow when more people are set up. I saw one guy Jerry rigging some book stands for his books after he saw my setup. So like. At least I'm getting people to get their books up and facing the audience. But um, I kind of feel like my display doesn't feel professional enough. And it feels too much like a flea market here at ALAC or ALAAC. So um, I don't know. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to sleep on it and come back tomorrow with fresh eyes. Tomorrow is our 9 to what? 5? Mm -hmm. Or 9 to 7? 5. Our 9 to 5 day. Um, had one sale. It was for two original pieces of art. Otherwise, there wasn't really a lot of foot traffic and not too many people stopped by the table. Not sure if there, because like it's very overwhelming in there. There's a lot to see and a lot to do. So I'm not sure if they didn't make their way over. There was also super tasty catering to eat. Um, and I think Michelle Obama gave the keynote speech and there were crazy cues to see her um, or to see the keynote. And then once that started, there was like nobody in the lobby. So, um, you know, it's hard to tell. It's the first day. Um, and it's a very different type of show. So, um, I think tomorrow I will have a better idea and hopefully I can act on that better idea. But for now, we are going to go get some crawfish like you do. And I'm going to go pick up some plate stands and safety pins and see if I can find a better solution for my mini comics. Okay, so we're here on day two. I'm really impressed that it managed to stay up overnight. I kind of had my fears and doubts, but here we are. I've got some book plates to kind of revitalize the table setup. So let's go ahead and get started. Hey guys, good morning. So this is the second official day of ALAAC 2018 in New Orleans, Louisiana. It is the first full day and it is Saturday. So we are here, it's probably about 9.30 in the morning if you would do a 360. It's like trying to figure out what's going to Since we're in New Orleans, I assume most of the librarians went out, had a lovely night last night, and are probably taking it easy this morning, maybe enjoying a tour or two. There's a lot to see in this city, a lot to enjoy. So I kind of feel like we're probably not going to start seeing a crowd so, um, you know, I'm here. I'm here to talk. I'm here to chat. I'm here to sing the gospel of comics and here to be friendly. And I will be here until it ends at five, I believe. I will be here until five. Hello. But um, I'm not going to lose hope or get discouraged if people are not yet in yet. I'm sure they're enjoying this wonderful city. So, as you guys can see, I fixed the mini situation. They are now up and out. I removed the mini prints book and I removed the commissions book. So hopefully it's a little bit cleaner. It is certainly a lot more comics focused. Um, I was talking about it last night with Joseph. I am a little concerned for a show like this with all the original art that it does feel sort of cluttered. Yes. 
But the original art is a big part of who I am and what I do. So it's still pretty important to me to leave up, but I'm still brainstorming better ways to sort of solve that problem. So I'll check in with you guys later in the day to give you a report of how today went. So, all right, so this is the silent auction with the pieces that are up for sale. And I'm not gonna go up and get everybody's art, but you can see mine is there on the end. So you probably recognize the piece. I'm trying to not be obtrusive. Um, and I'm definitely not gonna look at what was bid on it because I don't wanna know, but I'll probably send Joseph. Oh, there's Joseph interviewing Vernon. Vernon is awesome. He's a local comic person, local kid lit person. So I guess I found them, but I wanted to show you guys how nice the silent auction is and the beautiful quilts that are for auction and the beautiful art that is for auction. Hey guys, so day two of ALAAC has just ended. For those of you who are wondering why somebody might go to a show like ALAAC, since it's not a direct sales show, I've got one big word for you, editors. There are editors selling books at every single comic publisher booth there. And this is not a show that's typically super frequented by artists, and it's not a show that's available or open to the general public. It's $2,000 to get in. So these are editors who might be much more amenable to chatting, to going and getting drinks, or to taking a look at your portfolio or looking at your minis than they might be at any other convention. There are no formal portfolio review opportunities at this show, but I've had the chance to talk to so many editors who were just kind of casually walking around, enjoying the artist alley. Um, just, how do I how do I phrase this? Words, words, words. So many people who, um, I would normally never get a chance to talk to, I was able to talk to today because there's something about ALAAC -A that kind of um, levels the playing field, I guess, or there's, it's kind of egalitarian because if you're tabling at this show, you're already a certain level of serious, you're already a certain level of educated, you're already a certain level of involved in the comics and the book industry. If you're not um, already published, you at least have a lot of skin in the game and you really care about publishing and making quality stuff. So everyone tends to treat you more like an equal and like you know what you're doing, which is really nice. And again, because this isn't a heavy sales con, this isn't like NYCC or SDCC where there's millions of people in attendance, um, even though this is a big show and it is in a big room a lot of that space is taken up by vendors selling big wares like chairs like I showed you guys earlier so there's more time to just kind of talk about things and more time for them to just kind of look at your art so today was a really really good day um I'm really excited tomorrow I'm going to try to make it a point and just kind of casually ask if um people are hiring and leave them with a copy of Cicada Summer um, no pressure, they can throw it away if they want to. Joseph got a really awesome interview with Miss Carol at Lion Forge. Thank you so much, by the way, for taking the time to talk to him, to answer his questions. I really hope this can um, answer some of your questions, some of my viewers' questions, some of other people's questions about um, pitching and editing and that sort of that sort of realm where we don't always we don't always have access to that information or it's not common knowledge. So I am really excited to watch that interview and to share it with you guys. I am so appreciative. Thank you so much. She also, he also got a fantastic interview with Vernon, one of my Louisiana friends who has a few comics out here. He's got two kid lit books that are published through Pelican Press, which is a Louisiana publishing company that typically publishes Louisiana focused books. Um, and he also lives and works in Louisiana, which presents its own interesting, unique challenges for being a comic artist. So I can't wait to share both interviews with you guys. And hopefully this weekend we can get some more phenomenal stuff. So I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. And hopefully tomorrow is a good day as well. 
guys, good morning. So we are on, let's see, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We are on day four of ALAAC 2018. And so it is Sunday morning and um, sales of books have been pretty good. I'm pretty happy about that. I'm getting to talk to lots of wonderful librarians and educators. And I went around and gave out a few copies of Picking and Peeling. Uh, as you guys can see, I shifted the table a little bit. I went ahead and I moved Kara stuff more towards the center, less off to the edge, and I put Thousand and One Nights over here in the in the corner where Kara was. So um, it does seem to be getting more interest like this, and uh, I hope today can continue on a good track. And I hope good things will come from this show. So I will check in with you guys later on. Oh, and I also just went and donated pretty much one of every zine I make to the zine pavilion over there. And what they do is they raffle off the zines to different libraries to help them start their own zine collection, which I think is a phenomenal thing. So I'll check in with you guys a little bit later. Hey guys, good morning. This is day five, right? Or is it day four? Day four of... Day four for you. Day four for me of ALAAC 2018 here in beautiful New Orleans. We've been so fortunate. The weather's been gorgeous. As you guys know, I'm from Luling, and uh, I usually describe Luling and New Orleans as like walking outside into a hot shower or walking into a hot wet blanket. And honestly, compared to many years of experience, the weather is gorgeous. It's even a little dry. It's much more tolerable than I'm used to. So this is just perfect weather for people who are not used to Louisiana summer heat. It's probably a little hot for some, but compared to what we know, this is pretty good. Um, and the skies have been blue and clear and high, just gorgeous weather. Um, the locals have been super friendly, um, like you do. But I'm, I'm really glad everybody's putting on a good face, a good, we're all on our best behavior to show these librarians a good time, which is fantastic. New Orleans deserves the best of press. In my opinion, I get so tired of people talking about Bourbon Street, like it's the only reason to come here because New Orleans has so much to offer. So it's been a phenomenal weekend. It's been a true pleasure to get to talk to librarians about 7-inch Kara, to show them my pages, to talk to them about wanting to make beautiful children's books that explore a variety of types of relationships. I mean, it's just been like a dream and yesterday we saw a lot more locals I actually got to have a really cool experience so as you guys know I grew up in St. Charles Parish as I guys have told you in other vlogs St. Charles Parish was not comics friendly at all when I was growing up I was kind of the weird duck there was one other person who did comics that I knew and we weren't friends so we didn't collaborate so comics in Luling was a very very lonely experience with a few teachers were very supportive, my parents were very supportive, but that was kind of the extent. But I met a librarian who's currently working in Destraham, which is part of St. Charles Parish, it's across the river, and they are preparing for their first comic convention like two weekends from now. Destraham is going to have a comic convention. I never thought I would see that day. I mean, shoot. Just three years ago, I had librarians at the Lakewood branch telling me comics weren't literature, and now Destrahan's doing a comic convention. So it's just phenomenal for me, and I really want to do what I can to be part of that and to contribute to that and be part of that that groundswell. Wow, that ground <laughs> that groundswell change because it was really hard growing up there, being the weird kid and being into comics and like. People kind of tolerated that I was into it, but they didn't really care. And to go from that to like, they're organizing a comic show for other people who were like me. Yeah. Anyway, I really want to try to be part of it. And, um, <laughs> sorry, it's, it's just been a good weekend. And, um, the South doesn't always get opportunities like this. Um, we don't. We don't get editors who come down here ever. We don't get publishers who come down here often. And if they are, they're usually just here to sell. They're not interested in us. And we don't get a chance to talk about our stories with people outside of Louisiana very often. 
Um, when I, as I lived in Nashville, as I live in Nashville, I really try to talk about my childhood in Louisiana. I try to educate them about that because it's important to me that um, the South and the Southern states work hard to show people that we're, we're not racist necessarily and we're not horrible and that we're kind, hardworking people who are passionate and intelligent and we just have, we just show that in different ways than other people are used to recognizing and we don't get a lot of press and we don't get a lot of coverage and when we do it's only because a hurricane came and dumped a bunch of water on our towns so um, it's just nice to like be a, a representative of that kind of change and um, it's also nice to see Louisiana embracing those of us who are trying to do that and um, supporting us and it's been it's been a really hard road so it's nice to see things changing and some of these things I honestly never thought I would see in my lifetime. I I never I never thought my podunk little parish would like change or care or be more open minded. I just I never thought I could go back there and feel like maybe it was home. And hearing that, it's like, oh my god, it might be time it's finally time I can move back and have a place and belong. So I'm sorry it apparently is a very emotional topic for me but um, I'm really really excited and I'm really really touched about getting the opportunity to do that and to, to show my comics to people in Louisiana to kids who've never seen themselves in comics who've never seen any sort of representation of themselves reflected in anything that isn't kind of a joke and isn't kind of a stereotype it, it hopefully I can be part of that and do my best to help change and help um, inspire these kids, give them something to see themselves in, give them something to dream about. Because when I was a girl, I thought, I, I thought I'd have to move to Japan to make comics, is really what I thought. And then web comics came along and I realized I could self-publish on the web. And then self-publishing improved drastically and I realized I could self-publish and self-distro and it doesn't, you don't, oh, feel free to flip through things, pick up things if you want. Uh, <laughs> recording a vlog and having a meltdown like you do uh, but uh, I just you know things have changed so much since I was a 15 year old girl who figured she'd have to move to Japan just to make comics with the kind of art style and the kind of storytelling she wanted to make so I am so grateful that I can be a part of this and maybe help contribute to that change but this weekend has just been truly phenomenal so much better for me than the one in San Francisco um, Maybe I'm better prepared, maybe I'm in a better mental state, maybe I, um, maybe just it's time for things to click. I don't really, I don't really know, I'm not going to question it, but it's been a really great weekend. I've gotten to meet so many phenomenal people. Hopefully we'll have some amazing interviews. I really hope we're going to have some amazing interviews for you guys. Um, we were able to learn so much. So many people were willing this show to explain things to us. Whereas in the past, it really felt like uh, I was beating my head against a brick wall and just getting told it's too hard, don't try, don't bother. A lot of people are like, it's gonna be hard. These are the things you should be looking at. These are the things you should be looking for. Um, so I will check in with you guys later when I'm a little less emotional, a little less, and uh, or I'll start this all over again like you do. But um, thank you guys so much. And if you are, if you have an ALAAC that's going to be in your area, you should definitely try to apply. Uh, especially if you're a comics person, there is an artist alley for you, and there were tables that were yet unclaimed. So there's room for everybody, I think. So if your work fits, if you've got diverse comics, if you want to reach a range of people, this could be a phenomenal place for you to do so. Thank you guys for watching. So, um, but it was a really, really good show. A lot has changed since the 2015. A lot of the attitudes towards comics have changed since 2015. A lot of librarians have been working really hard to push the importance and the value of comics in libraries and the importance and value of literacy and comic literacy and how comics promote um, literacy skills and how they're good for early readers and how they're phenomenal for getting teens back into the library and a lot of librarians are very manga friendly so I guess because um, manga is what's kind of changed the tide for getting teenagers back in the library because the thing about manga as you guys
guys surely know, is some of our favorite series will be 40 volumes. We can't afford that. So who can afford that? The library can afford that. So we can go plow through all 40 volumes in two weeks because the library helps facilitate that. That's something that a library can offer that is very unique that we cannot offer for ourselves. And it's a phenomenal alternative to like piracy. So um, it was also really cool because I think a lot of manga publishers have figured that out because Viz was there, Yen Press was there, they were giving away books, oh, uh, Tokyo Pop, which I have, I have kind of uh, conflicting feelings about Tokyo Pop. Um, they were there, so there were manga publishers there giving away books, talking about their books, doing presentations on their books. So um, it really seems like we're finally at that point where like librarians are ready and the market is ready and um, the publishers are ready. So that's really exciting. Um, there is definitely a point in my life, like in 2015, I thought we were never going to get there because I was getting a lot of librarians in San Francisco who, um, and I don't, I'm not saying they're from San Francisco, I'm just saying that's the show I was at, who, um, they, they didn't like comics, they didn't consider comics literature, all the other old sad tire tropes that we've been fighting, um, and I really did not see that here in New Orleans. Now, I was a little disappointed because I did see, I did end up meeting a few local librarians. In fact, there was one from Destrahan, and uh, you guys saw me cry about that because Destrahan's having their first Comic Con, uh, like in two weeks. And like, I never, I'm 32, I graduated in 2005. When I did my senior project, there was no teacher who could help me with my senior project. There was no one in my community who could be a mentor for me because we didn't have any comic artists. Um, so I had like a talented art teacher kind of take pity on me and agree to like check in on my pages and that. But like, I was super weird. I was a weird duck. Nobody really understood what I wanted to do. And I wasn't even that artsy, y'all. I was just like, they didn't have a clue what to do with me. And I really thought I would never be able to come back to St. Charles Parish and 100% fit in. I'm not that I'll ever 100% fit in anywhere, but I never thought, I always thought it would feel like home, but not feel like home. Like it would always be something missing. And I just figured like anywhere I lived, it would always be like something was missing. Um, because I can't, and like not that Nashville is very comics friendly, but like I will always feel like my family's missing in Nashville. And when I lived in Savannah, which was much more comics friendly because SCAD, um, I just had these huge holes in my heart because I was away from my friends and my family and from Joseph. So. I just sort of always figured there was never going to be a home for me. And what's really amazing is that um, I'm looking to move back to Louisiana. I want to I want to teach or work. I specifically want to teach like art in Louisiana. It's really important to me, and I really want to do it in my home parish, which is St. Joe's Parish. And Destrehan, which is not where I grew up, it's the sister city, and they had like a little bit of a friendly rivalry going on. Destrehan is actually where I wanted to live. And I've wanted to live in Destrehan for a while. Um, so the fact that Destrehan's library is hosting a Comic Con, I just, and I'm like currently trying really hard to move back home, was just like it, like it felt like fate kind of thing. So um, I'm gonna really, really try to make it for that. I'm actually going to have to do, <laughs> do some, uh, some weird travel planning and it's gonna really, really screw up my schedule, but it's super important to me that I be there for that. Um, so that was something that could only have happened at this ALAAC this year in New Orleans. Like it would not have happened for me anywhere else. Now I was disappointed that there weren't as many librarians from Louisiana there as um, considering it's in Louisiana and a lot of librarians who I talked to outside of the show said that it's because their libraries couldn't afford to send them and it is $2,000 to get in. So something I would like to see happen is either ALAAC facilitate getting local librarians into that show and maybe facilitate getting area artists into that show and um, I'd also like to see um, that's, that's it that's what I'd like to see like either a reduced rate because they're local artists or a free or local librarians because they're local and this might be the only time they ever get to go to an ALAAC in their entire lives or maybe find like corporate sponsors for their libraries or something. I know libraries are not into taking money on premises, so this might not be a feasible thing. 
but it would be really nice, especially for places like Louisiana, to have more Louisiana librarians actually be able to attend the show. Um, and more Louisiana artists be able to attend the show because opportunities to meet editors never come to Louisiana. Like unless that editor's on vacation and you just happen to be their bartender or some crazy twist of fate, it doesn't happen for you. Um, and that was one of my big fears about moving back to Louisiana is like, is this gonna kill my career? But honestly, Nashville killed my career. So it can't get deader than dead, right? Um, not that it's like 100% dead, but you know. Those of you who live in non-comic cities know how much harder it is to like just get out there and get those opportunities. So if there is an ALAAC in your area, if you have a graphic novel, a comic series, something like that, even if it's self-published, if you have an ISBN, if you have a Baker and Taylor number, if you publish through Create Space, you should definitely try to get a table there. I think it's worth your while. I think it presents very unique opportunities that are not available or accessible to many artists. Um, I think a comic collective could do really well there. If your work is um, smaller, shorter in duration than that, there are zine pavilions. And this ALAAC had um, like tabling zine artists from the local area, which was really cool. So a lot of Nocus Fest people were there. So that was cool because I don't normally get to see them outside of Nocus Fest. So like, I, I feel like I give a very different impression at that show than, I, than who I am most of the time. So it was cool to get to interact with them like in a different in a different capacity and in a different kind of setting. So I really enjoyed it. I am really, really, really hoping a lot of good stuff can I can I can like you know level up myself and uh, attain a higher level like a Super Saiyan whatever. Um, <laughs> I'm really hoping that this could be a good turning point for me and a, a an opportunity to start a new chapter in my life. Um, so I'm feeling, if you guys can't tell, I'm feeling really, really, really good about it. It's not a money-making con. Um, the guys next to us were a little bit disappointed because they didn't sell as many books as they'd like, but they did get to do a lot of phenomenal outreach and talk about the work that they do. So um, they did get to do that, and they did have a lot of free stuff to give away, which is definitely very smart. I mean, they've done ALAAC before, so they know what they're doing. I'm just saying, like, don't expect to sell more books than you would sell at like, you know, your average indie con, your average library show, your average free comic book day, your average anime con. Um, you're probably not going to sell more than 20 books, so don't break your rack bringing a bunch of books. You can talk. Okay. Uh, to you or to the kid? Whatever you want to do, but project. Uh, no. Okay. Joseph wants to add something. Can you tell me? Personally, the people next to you had been to an ALA AC. They went to ALA Midwinter. Oh, I'm sorry. They went to ALA Midwinter. So they hadn't been to the big annual conference. Secondly, there's no such thing as a Baker and Taylor number. It's just an ISBN. And you're okay. listed on Baker and through Baker. Oh, okay. Baker All right. So Baker and Taylor is a listing and distribution site. So there isn't an individual number for that. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. That's an ink. Am I looking? Am I talking about an Ingrams? Number? No. Okay, so really ISBN number, yes. and then you get you want to be listed through these other services. And if you go through Create Space, they'll list you on Baker and Taylor as part of the package. And, and you can you can choose to you be can listed. choose right, but it doesn't cost extra money, right? Not to my knowledge. Right. And Baker and Taylor and Ingram are two of the big um, services that librarians can order their books from for their libraries, not for personal purchase. Now, some libraries do have like zine collections and indie comic collections, and they do have a special dis dispensation for that, but I don't really know a lot about that, and I have noticed that the artists who tend to be involved in that kind of stuff can be really shady about giving answers. The exception would be for the New Orleans Library. They were very, uh, the Nocus Fest organizers actually w organized a zine collection to get into that collection, and they were very open about it. Um, so if you are interested in possibly getting in the New Orleans Public Library with your zines, they would be a great place to start because they help facilitate that. But I've had a lot of other uh, zine collection organizers be really shady about not wanting to give me straight answers, I guess because they think I'm not good enough. So um, I can't speak to that, but I would love to like get an interview with someone who has worked with that and can maybe answer some of those questions for those of you guys who would be interested in that. Um, what else did I miss or not talk about? Uh, the 
weren't many kids there. Yo, no, there weren't many kids there. This is not, there were more kids than I've ever seen at an yeah. AAC, and that there was like ten kids. Um, but it's not a, it's not that kind of show. Editors it's, occasionally walked around. Editors would walk around. Um, so like it's like a catch twenty two because it seemed like every time I left my table, someone cool came to talk to Joseph. But I did get lucky a few times because a few of those times I as as they were coming up, I was also coming up, so I got to talk to them myself about my own work, or I was the one manning the table and they got to talk to me. But it really felt like a lot of the times I left the table to go talk to people, they were actually walking around the show and I, I like, just missed them. So um, that don't get discouraged with that. Um, the name tags used to say things like editor, um, sales rep, artist, etc., and they do have these like tags. I would look down to like see if I was wearing my name tag. That was last day. Was um, they don't anymore. It just says exhibitor. But something you can do, and I didn't think it work, is I left, and I'm going to change all of the names because nothing has been anything yet, and I don't want to jinx myself. You can leave a copy of your comic or your mini or whatever it is that you have as like a freebie to leave with people you can leave that with like a sales rep and they might be able to get it to somebody who can help you out so or it might not you know like it's it's a gamble but it could be a gamble that pays off at least enough that someone who might be interested in comics and interested in publishing your work might be able to get back to you so yeah that is also an option so I would recommend you consider doing that if you're having trouble finding editors but it's also cool if you do know that someone is an editor or um, a publisher it's really cool to be able to go and introduce yourself and like so they can associate a name with a face and I also was like you should come see us in the artist alley if you get a chance and I think I don't know if any of them got to do that because I didn't see too many of them walking around myself, but I was also away from the table out talking to people sometimes. So, you know, it's like that. Lots of food. Yeah, well, this was, okay, so when we did it in San Francisco, there wasn't lots of food options. So it does vary by the convention center. This one was in the Ernest Morial Convention Center. There's so much food there, but it closes really early. So if there is ever another ALAAC, in New Orleans at the convention center. Keep in mind that food options are non-existent in the convention center at five. You're gonna have to, well, it closes at five. Um, at even like two, there weren't really food options anymore, which is super weird to me because not everybody eats at noon. But um, there was food, there was coffee there. Parking was $15 a day. If you're in New Orleans, you're probably going to also be paying parking in New Orleans. Um, it may be cheaper to just take a lift for your travel. New Orleans can be dangerous in sections by at night, so do exercise caution, be aware, uh, try to be careful, um, try not to take undue risks, don't walk through neighborhoods you are unsure about or don't know. Um, uh, ALAAC is huge. The convention center it was in this time wasn't actually as big as the one in San Francisco, but I heard so I heard a lot of people being like, this place is ginormous. And like, all I could think was like, no, it was ginormous in 2015. But um, it is a really big convention and a lot of librarians will get tired before they even can get back to the artist alley. So one of the changes I would like to recommend, and it's a totally selfish change, is that you put the artist alley towards the front or find some way to showcase the art and the artists who are going to be there towards the front of the hall and that would give you guys some beautiful art to display and that would also um, because ALAC has a lot of like corporate stuff going on like they're selling their chick steel case was there so they're selling chairs and like a lot of stuff for convention furniture and um, like this really cool elevator kind of thing for books for like storing books in a compact space so there's a lot of um, very corporate stuff there too and having some original I mean they do have the original art auction and I actually did not see what the carapace went for so I have no idea what curled up in a good book went for um, I don't know I, I'm, I also thought if I looked I would like either be like oh my god it's not worth that it's 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 that's way too much money I don't deserve it wait, 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 wait. or I would be like oh really though that's watercolor y'all you got it for a steal um, so I didn't want to actually look because I thought it would 
it would, um, I don't know, jinx it. And uh, it was like the only, I did not get like all on top of the auction because when I went by, you guys saw it actually, there were still people looking at stuff and I thought it might be rude to take a video of other people's art without their permission. Um, mine was the only color piece I saw. I'm sure there were other color pieces, right? Like a lot of the pieces look like sketches though. I mean, I guess if it's coming from someone who is well known, that's like innate value in and of itself. I mean, to have like an original Raina Telgemeier sketch in your kid section is definitely really cool. And I'm sure your kids would love that. So that's definitely worth more in terms of like value to your students and your, your attendees than like having something of mine up there. So like I get that, but like there was also people in the alley who I'd never heard before and I'm pretty on top of comics. So I, I don't know. I always feel like I need to like go at it with 110%. So when I, when I pitch pieces for auctions like this, I always do what I do best and I always go with like full watercolor so that they have the original to, to sell and it's not a print and um, it's in full color. It might be kind of small. I, did, I choose to do the eight by 10 just because um, it's the smaller of the two formats but it's, I also do full, full color. So there's like background illustration, etc. cetera. Um, is there anything, oh, you can buy a table apparently. And if your work isn't accepted for the auction and I have heard, but don't hold me to it, that it is about $200. And I do know that ALAAC is actually looking to expand their artist alley and have more artists and do more with that. So I'm really excited to see. Um, their coordinator, Ailey, seems really cool and checked in with me multiple times and I don't think that I, I know she is new since 2015 and all I can do is compare it to 2015 but I don't think anybody checked on me ever in 2015 maybe maybe, maybe but certainly not the artist alley coordinator so that first a con that size or a show that size to have the artist alley coordinator check in on me like three times over the weekend is really really awesome and to get to give feedback and tell them what I enjoy about the show one-on-one -on -one is really nice and I always appreciate when cons are receptive to that kind of information something Joseph so something Joseph recommended and I think it's actually a really cool idea maybe not done like this but he was suggesting that something the silent auction could do is put the originals on pedestals leading up to the artist alley which would lead attendees through what I would do is I would actually print banners with those pieces and have the banners leading up to the artist alley. You don't think so? Because I do think the auction stuff should all be in one place because they have the sheets right there. But you could do like a photocopy or something. Right in front of each of the pieces. Because we have to submit, I had to submit a scan of what I wanted to what I wanted to turn in for them like a month ahead of time. No, it was more than that. But I also tried to get my stuff all in early. Um, but at least a month ahead of time I had to submit a scan of my work and I ended up doing two pieces and then letting my patrons vote on which piece they thought was the stronger piece um, and I'm really happy with their pick because I, I did the Cajun night well I did Kara like in a tent of the Cajun night before Christmas because it's that's like all right so that seems to be like the only book about living in Louisiana that librarians in Louisiana ever seem to pick for us. And we have lots more books about living in Louisiana now, but like growing up, I kind of hated that book because I'd heard it like 300 times and I'm not Cajun, I'm Creole. So like, that was another thing that was always really frustrating for me growing up in, in Around Bayou Gosh and Luling is uh, like everyone around me was Cajun or said they were Cajun. Um, and I find out from my mom later that no, they're just pretending. But there's like such a cultural push in this area to identify as Cajun. Um, and I found that really repulsive because I wasn't Cajun. So I wanted to, with like Kara for example, I wanted to tell a story about people who are not stereotypically Cajun whatsoever. I wanted to just kind of show like a normal, to normal to my standards, normal to what I know, um, Louisiana family living in like kind of a really normal suburb and not like play up the the, <laughs> the Cajun aspect of Kara. It's not something I really wanted to do. I'm all, ex oh, I'm all about exploring Louisiana from a cultural standpoint. I am really tired of Cajun culture being exploited and presented as the only option 
available. Like when I went to SCAD, they all expected me to talk like Gambit. You know, like I, I, I hate, I, I love Gambit. His accent was a joke when we were kids. Did y'all make fun of, I mean, we all tried to talk like Gambit as a kid, but we also all kind of made fun of Gambit because like he doesn't sound like any real Cajun ever. Um, but we also all kind of wanted to bang him because he was hot. So, you know, weird, weird feelings for Gambit from the X-Men. But um, anyway, that's like, I'm talking a lot at you guys. It was a really good show. I'm really happy I went. I'm really excited for next year. And I really am touched and thrilled and excited and motivated by the thought of doing comics that explore Louisiana life in a way that people around the country can enjoy and understand us um, and explore things that are uniquely American without being apple pie and baseball and explore things that are dear to my heart and important to me and that I want other people to know about and I want them to love it and to do so maybe living in Louisiana again and maybe getting to be around my family and getting to see the people I love all the people I love, or most of the people I love, all the time, in a place that I love, eating the food that I love, um, I, I, I just, I didn't think that I would have the option to have both, and now it seems like maybe I do have the option to have both, and that's just phenomenal for me. So, thank you guys for watching. I hope this recap has been helpful, informative, and useful for you guys. Um, ALAAC is not an anime convention. Um, it is not your typical convention. Um, it doesn't get your typical convention attendees. The budgets are very different. Um, my average sale was, so I looked at Square and my average sale was $21, but a lot of people spent like $80 at the booth to buy art, to buy books. So a lot of what people wanted were the nicer things that I really love being able to sell. Now that said, I didn't really offer many prints. I had the I had the up thing, my my scrapbook page up, but I didn't have the book out the whole show because it took up too much space. And I didn't have my stickers out like at all that weekend. And I did have the wooden charms out and people did like those, but I sold quite a few, well, not quite a few, but I sold a few of the painted wooden charms. Um, but it was mostly about books and getting to talk about the books. So if you're gonna do ALAAC, you need to have free giveaway stuff that people can enjoy. Um, postcards could be a great option. You want it to have an attractive piece of art from the comic or the story that you're working on. Something like, so if you're a writer, you might wanna commission someone to do something like that. You want something visual and inviting that captures the style and tone of the story. You also want the ISBN number. Like you want people to know you have an ISBN number. They are starting to learn that indie artists do have access to that. So they will ask, which is really nice because they just assumed in 2015 that I didn't have one. Um, they're asking now, which means they're interested. And um, so I have like that little placard on the book that's like, I have an, a middle grade something. What, what the little, it doesn't know. But it's like middle grade readers and it had my ads been and number and it's like also available on Amazon. Not that I see like any money from Amazon because if I if I cranked it up to where I'd get like a dollar for each book, it'd be $21 a book. And I don't think that's right. <coughs> like I can't charge someone $25, $21 for Kara. I just, not, not, you know. I want everyone to have it and $21 is not an everyone can have it price. Um, so make sure you have an I, you have things that have your ISBN number on it. So I have the Kara postcards, which were for volume one. I need to do them for volume two, which is gonna be coming out hopefully soon. Um, I also have a notepad. I think I showed you guys that, that has like her face and it has the tagline and it has the ISBN number. And I write a lot of things down for people, like books they might enjoy, sites that might benefit them. So that's cool. Hopefully they'll check out my, um, my book a little bit more and I also have my teaching artist postcards and I think those are really beneficial too because they opened up an opportunity for me to talk to librarians especially youth librarians and media specialists about the fact that I do workshops and I'm willing to do workshops via Skype or Google Hangouts so um, for people who live in kind of remote areas that might not have any comic artists that they're aware of I can Skype in and we can talk about making comics or making zines and I can do demonstrations for them and it also links to my blog and my YouTube channel where I have lots of free tutorials for people to follow along with. So 
um, if you do anything sort of extracurricular, community service-y like that, that could also be a really good opportunity for you to promote doing that and make yourself sort of a more valuable resource to libraries and librarians. So I really firmly believe that librarians and libraries are huge for getting teenagers and kids to read comics for providing access to comics for these people who may not have their own source of income. I am so pumped that so many libraries see themselves as a community resource and are trying to provide a more holistic approach towards um, resources. Like one library and I spoke to, you could check out sports equipment. And that's really cool because like these kids lived in an area where they would not have had access to that financially and now they do and now they can go play soccer after they've done X amount of reading or whatever. So libraries are really expanding and um, many are changing to suit the needs of their community and it even seems like places resistant to change or slow, are beginning to change so I'm really really excited about that. And I think libraries, especially if they continue to provide these sort of resources, will always have a place in the American framework. So if you haven't been to your local library in a while, you should go check it out. I bet it's totally different from what you remember. And I bet they've got something you will really, truly enjoy. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope it was helpful and useful for you guys. And I hope you guys will check out some of the amazing interviews we managed to get this week. I will see you guys again really soon with another con recap because I have MechaCon coming up at the end of July. So, bye guys!